Are all bats rabid? Are vampire bats specifically more dangerous than other bat species? And what do you do when a bat gets into your house? What are you doing? A bat got into the house and I'm trying to keep it at bay. Have you seen my hair? It's just asking for a bat to get tangled in it. Wear a hat. What's with the garlic? Look, every th everything that I've ever learned about vampires from TV and movies tells me that garlic keeps them away. Please don't tell me that you seriously think that that bat is a vampire. No, if, no, of course not. Everybody knows that vampires live in places like Eastern Europe and the Pacific Northwest. This is just a regular bat, but bats carry rabies. I don't want that in my hair. Very few bats carry rabies. Look, I was once pooped on by a vampire bat in Costa Rica, and I was fine. You got pooped on by a vampire bat? I think you're just making that up to make yourself sound tougher. No, it was just sort of a thing that happened. However, if I'm going to be completely honest, I'm a bit of a hypochondriac, and so I was a little freaked out when it happened. But I just made sure to wash it really well with soap and water. Look, if you want to stop swinging the foam sword at the poor bat, I can tell you about the experience, the science of bats and rabies, and once you and the bat are a little calmer, I can help you get it out of here. So I've heard this claim that all bats carry rabies, which sounds a bit hyperbolic. All bats? Really? This makes an ideal first episode of a new series all about wildlife and nature misconceptions. And so over the course of this video, I plan to discuss rabies and bats, specifically vampire bats, because they capture the imagination with their hematophagous diet. Before I can get into discussing the feeding biology of vampire bats and show you my hunt for them, let's talk about the biology of the rabies disease to help understand its relationship with bats. Now, the disease is viral in origin, but rabies or similar diseases can be caused by several related lysoviruses, with the rabies virus being the most common, but several other viruses exist that often were first isolated from bats and are generally endemic to a specific region. These viruses are transmitted generally through saliva, such as a bite or a scratch. However, they are also suspected to be a STD. Interestingly, contact with blood, feces, or urine does not seem to be much of a risk, so I guess my contact with vampire bat fecal material was not a possible rabies exposure. All of these lysoviruses use RNA as the genetic material and are somewhat related to a few other notable RNA viruses such as measles and Ebola. The rabies virus's primary target is the neurons of the brain, which are hijacked for viral replication, which occurs entirely in the cytoplasm in special Negri bodies, which are constructed by ribonucleic proteins the virus produces. Once in the brain, the viral replication causes inflammation, rabies encephalitis, which results in two forms of the disease, paralytic or dumb rabies, which slowly causes the infected individual to become comatose, and the far more infamous furious rabies, which causes hyperactivity, aggression, and fear of water, which is why the disease is also referred to as hydrophobia, such as in the classic boy and dog story, Old Yeller. Hydrophobia is an interesting symptom because it's specifically meant to make the disease more likely to transmit, as after the virus has invaded the brain, it moves to the salivary glands. Not wanting to drink water and even having trouble swallowing means there is more virus in the mouth of the victim, ideal for it to spread through a bite. I feel like I am describing a zombie movie, and like in one of those, infected individuals are essentially the walking dead. Once the disease becomes symptomatic, it is always fatal. Or as close to always fatal as a disease can be, with furious rabies ending in respiratory and cardiac arrest after a few days. Fortunately today, a vaccine exists in case of exposure, which the World Health Organization categorizes into three categories of exposure. Category 1 being contact with an animal but no skin is broken, which is no exposure. Category 2 is nibbling or minor scratches, which is exposure, and it is recommended to clean out the wound and be vaccinated. And finally, Category 3 is a bite or scratch that breaks skin and is bleeding, requiring again cleaning out the wound and immediate vaccination. But this category also says any direct contact with bats is considered to be in Category 3. So does this mean all bats are rabid, or that they are uniquely suited to transmit rabies? 
Studies of diseases in bats are extensive, with 300 to 1,200 papers on the topic published a year, which inevitably has created a bias, making it seem that bats have more viral strains associated with them, helping form this image of bats as a disease cesspool among animals. As stated earlier, several rabies-causing lysoviruses are associated with bats in certain geographic areas. While globally dogs are the greatest source of rabies in human populations, widespread rabies vaccination in dogs in the Americas has led bats to become a primary source of the disease. I have also heard this interesting claim that rabies is the only viral disease that is fatal to bats, and I really wanted to see if I could substantiate it, but I could not seem to find any peer-reviewed literature. While rabies does kill bats, unlike in other mammals, bats don't always develop the disease after exposure. These facts have led to the general practice that every bat should be treated as infected, and thus requires a rabies vaccination. So does this mean that all bats carry the virus? No, it does not. Rabies is actually quite rare in bats, with random surveys of bat populations showing an incidence often less than one half of 1%. While bats that seem obviously sick or are already dead do have a higher rabies virus incidence of between 5 and 20%. Though rare, bats do spread the disease, and in Central and South America, one species in particular gets the bulk of the blame, Desmodus rotundus, the common vampire bat. Like the name suggests, these bats want to drink blood, which makes them the only living mammals to be parasitic. There are actually three species of vampire bats in Central and South America, but the other two usually prefer to feed on avian blood, though they do sometimes turn to mammals, including humans. Vampire bats have many unique features to aid in their strange diets. Unlike nearly every other bat, they are maneuverable on the ground, hopping about on all fours. The incisors and canines of these bats are oversized, and thus they have fewer teeth in their mouth than in other bat species. The upper incisors are special because they lack enamel, which allows them to be razor sharp. They even have horny papillae on the tip of the tongue, which some scientists have hypothesized are used to sharpen the incisors. The super sharp incisors are used to pierce the hide of their prey. The best spot to bite is determined by perhaps their weirdest adaptation, the ability to detect thermal radiation, like a rattlesnake or python, with modified cells around the bat's nose. Upon drawing blood, the bat's tongue has two lateral grooves that expand and contract with tongue motion, helping the bat more efficiently lap up blood. To make feeding even easier, the bat's saliva contains anticoagulants to keep the blood from clotting allowing the bat to lap up as much blood as the bat wants. They feed on a diverse variety of larger mammals, and sometimes these bats bite and feed on human blood. This makes them really easy to blame for rabies cases, and in the past, scientific studies have found that in some parts of South America, 960 people out of 100,000 died because of a vampire bat bite, which is about 1 in 100 people. This, though, has been criticized as the numbers are derived from a single community, and thus heavily biased, creating unnecessary fear-mongering about vampire bats. In fact, what has been found in many subsequent studies is that the majority of human rabies transmitted from bats in the tropical Americas actually has not been found to come from vampire bats at all. So with all this scapegoating of vampire bats in mind, let's travel into a flashback to meet a colony of them. Back in 2019, I was in the cloud forests of Costa Rica in the Monteverde area, surrounded by the spectacular biodiversity of this region. I'd always been interested in bats, and finding vampire bats in these neotropical forests was at the top of my potential target species list. Vampire bats roost in a variety of places, such as caves, but also, like many rainforest bats, inside tree hollows. It was in one special hollow like this I met a colony of vampire bats. The first and most notable thing about a vampire bat roost is the blackened wood around the hollow that looks like the tree was burned out in a fire. This is not actually the case as the color is due to staining by the bat's feces, which due to their blood-rich diet is incredibly dark. To get a look at the colony within, I had to stick my head into the tree hollow, and it was in filming these shots of vampire bat dropping fell on my arm. It wasn't very runny, just a dark pellet that fell on me. After a quick look, I moved on. Not exactly the most exciting vampire bat story ever told, and definitely would love to one day get a chance to see them feeding at night, particularly after seeing all the BBC Natural History Units footage of them feeding on marine mammals and penguins on the coasts of South America. 
but I have seen wild vampire bats. The great shame is that the vampire bat conjures the idea of a terrifying creature of the night, invoking the long and complex folklore surrounding both vampires and bats, and this has vilified an interesting and mostly harmless mammal. I am fairly sure this is why a fear-mongering study that says they are a rather significant rabies vector doesn't immediately seem unreasonable. Which yeah, they can spread rabies, but that is still quite rare. I also have not mentioned the other big fear surrounding bats and rabies, which is it being transmitted to livestock, which vampire bats actually have been shown to prefer over both humans and native species like tapir. This fear by ranchers and farmers has led to bat eradication. This can be achieved by boarding up cave entrances, or more horrifically, burning piles of tires inside caves, covering the rocks in thick soot, and filling the air with noxious chemicals, making the interiors of these caves entirely uninhabitable for bats and other cave life. This has non-discriminately caused bat population declines throughout Central America, with entire bat populations eradicated from their traditional roosts. Rehabilitating the image of vampire bats is essential not only for their survival, but also bats in general, many of which are important for insect control, especially the mosquito, an animal far more likely to transmit a deadly disease to humans. Vampire bats are quite remarkable animals, and when scientists finally began to investigate their lives, something astonishing was discovered. Vampire bats will share food with each other, a quite altruistic behavior only seen in a few other highly intelligent mammals such as dogs, chimpanzees, and humans. Now, scientists generally don't describe such food sharing as true altruistic behavior, generally saying these occur between related individuals, thus ensuring some of the same genes are passed on. It is essential for vampire bats to feed on blood, and going without a drink for more than 70 hours will result in the bat's death. This means not being able to locate a suitable host in just two nights puts a bat on the edge of survival. However, if a bat fails to find a meal one night, the bat will usually be fed by bats that did succeed. Studying who gets and gives blood shows several interesting patterns. As generally found with seemingly altruistic behavior, relatedness is predictive of receiving. But surprisingly, so does familiarity with an unrelated individual. To quickly anthropomorphize the bats in order to build an empathetic connection with you, dear viewer, vampire bats share blood with their friends. Even more interestingly, while bats do sometimes beg for food, often it appears that a bat that missed a meal will be approached by one that did and be fed. Looking into if this relationship is symmetrical, with bats getting repaid for sharing food, it seems yes, but over a quite long time frame, longer than similar behaviors among primates. The big head-scratcher for evolutionary biologists is how this could be stable, as such a system could easily be exploited by cheaters, which would cause the system to be unstable in the face of natural selection. How is this long-term system of sharing enforced, a gap in knowledge that perhaps a young bat scientist could research? Anyway, I think it's time to go deal with that bat in the house. So the bat probably isn't rabid? I doubt it. So can we catch it? No, while very few bats carry rabies, you have to remember that they are reservoirs, and so they should always be treated as though they might. Isn't that like a contradiction, telling me not all bats are rabid, but also telling me I should assume any I interact with are? I know it may seem like that. It's all about recognizing that it is unlikely, while also respecting the fact that the bat may have the disease, and so we are not going to have any physical contact with the bat. I guess that makes sense. Let's get the bat out of here. Now the most important thing to do when faced with a bat in the house is to determine if any people or pets have had contact with the bat. If you are absolutely certain there has not been any contact, then you can proceed to try and get the bat out of the house. If you are not sure, or there has definitely been contact, then you need to have the bat tested for rabies, which means you need to contact your local animal control agency. The reason you have to be cautious is while rabies cases have been declining, there has been a recent rise, particularly in the United States, in what is called cryptic rabies. People contracting rabies without being aware they were bitten by an animal. There are cases where in the time a bat brushes against someone, the bat is able to bite. Now, if there hasn't been any contact with the bat, simply open the doors and windows to the outside and close all others, so the bat has a chance to just leave. If the bat is not leaving, the bat can be herded by holding up a sheet between two people. 
slowly restricting the bat's movement until all that is left for the bat to do is fly out a door or window. Don't try to catch the bat with a net or a broom or a tennis racket. You're just asking for a Category 3 rabies exposure. Now, the CDC does actually have a method for catching bats, either if you cannot get the bat to leave at the previous methods, or you cannot get animal control to take the bat to testing. That is, to get a box and a piece of cardboard, when the bat lands, put the box over the bat, and then use the cardboard to get the bat into the box. I would not start with this method, as getting the bat to leave without trying to capture the frightened animal is going to be best for every party involved, and if there has been some contact, an actual trained professional is going to be better at capturing the bat than you. Thank you for helping me get the bat out of the house. You're welcome. I hope I showed you that you don't have to fear bats. Just respect them and give them their space. Yes, I think you taught me to be a little less afraid of bats and what to do if a bat gets into the house again. Thank you so much for watching this episode on vampire bats and rabies. I did quickly want to use this time to express a few lines about bats getting tangled in hair as I referenced it in the first few seconds of the video. This is often stated as flat out false, as bats are pretty good at avoiding obstacles as fine as human hair altogether. However, every time this subject gets brought up, inevitably someone always says this happened to their eccentric aunt they see once a year during the holidays. The truth is actually quite a bit more nuanced. My reference for this quick discussion goes way in depth, and the myths surrounding bats and hair are quite fascinating, but to quickly paraphrase, on occasion, bats do get caught in people's hair, but it is exceedingly rare. Anyway, this is the first episode of a new Nature Misconception series where I hope to explain and deconstruct myths about animals, wild places, and natural phenomena. Which means now, if you have stayed all the way through this video, I can tease the next episode in the series. I am going to show you that the Amazon rainforest is nowhere near as dangerous as you think it is.